conversation of our series about outstanding Italian women in the U.S. We started with a scientist, and the second one uh, was an art curator, and tonight uh, we have a musician, a composer, but also an important organizer of music, um, Paola Vestini. Uh, Paola Vestini is the, quote, I quote, the imaginative composer, according to New York Times, uh, visionary in chief, according to Time Out. She is the co-founder co and artist artistic director uh, of the Brooklyn Venue National Sawdust, one of the most innovative and spaces in town. And as a composer, she's one of the top 35 female composers in classical music for the Washington Post and on the top 100 composer in the world list by NPR. Uh, Pristini's music and works have been commissioned by and performed Camp Film Festival, Carnegie Hall, BAM, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the New York Philharmonic, and the Choir of Trinity Wall Street, among others, and many others. Uh, since uh, 1999, when she co founded the multimedia production company Vision into Art, while she was still a student at Juilliard, she has collaborated with poets, filmmakers, conservationists, and Astrophysicist in large scale multimedia works. Um, she was the author of the music for the fourth season of Mozart in the Jungle. Uh, I hope that many of you uh, know this beautiful series. Nuge work include Old Man and the Sea, a new opera theater work with Robert Wilson and Sallis, uh, and Sallis John and Godfrey Singler. Uh, Finn Steels, a monodrama for Mezzo Liv Gigliotti, director R.B. Schlatter and Cindy Sherman, and Edward Tulane with Libertist Mark Campbell, commissioned by Minnesota Opera and many other things. So please welcome Paolo Cristina. <laughs> I have no reason to introduce her because <laughs> <laughs> you, you know her very well. Please enjoy. Thank you, Giorgio. Thank you, Paola, for accepting to come here. Uh, so, uh, according to many people, uh, Williamsburg is the coolest place uh, in uh, New York, uh, and the National Sawdust is uh, for sure the coolest place in Williamsburg. Uh, Paola, you founded it in uh, uh, 2015. Uh, uh, yes. Exactly. And it's called Sodas because it used to be a factory. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, yes. Yes. Exactly. So let's start by watching a short video about uh, natural Sodas. It's this very special place. It's like a silence and chaos. And when I come here, the noise is gone, and and I start to be able to see the essence of my own thought. The the work here is really intimate, and it, it, you get a chance to really feel the artist and the work. And it takes me away from what can be so trivial and and so distracting, and it makes me realize that that's why we're living. And I think that. Doing that with a community and with intimacy the way Sawdust can do is really valuable. Sawdust gives space, time, and resources for projects that may not otherwise find a home. The venues have been turning away hip hop. And so for me to have a space to come to and say, hey, I want to wrap my head off <laughs> um, and really say something. Um, means a lot. My residency in December, I can't think of another place in town that would have supported that in the way that that project was supported. It was a total blissful joy being here. One thing that was really cool about that residency for me is that this was a moment that allowed for 
a real cool overlap and fusion of people from LA and New York to come together and have a weekend of really rich programming. What was shocking to me is that they asked me to do something, whatever I wanted to do. And so when we did Orphic Moments, it had a kind of energy. And in the room, there was a feeling of something new. Having the support system here at Sawdust of people who are open to these kinds of ideas, who can help you realize them, who can guide you, but also not limit you. This type of thing happens very infrequently. Because we're creating the new models in a world that needs some new models right now. We do it because I think we're looking for this connection. That's where I feel at home, these people who are interested in not just looking back and, and exploring the tradition, but sort of using that as a springboard to, to push this whole art form into the future. It's our opportunity to discover new and younger voices. And Sawdust has really given me experience and skills that I can apply all throughout the creative industry. And National Sawdust really makes me feel like this is what I'm supposed to do and I won't stop because of that. So I, I should say, I'm going to speak with this because I have a quiet voice. You can hear me, right? Yes. Um, you know, the, the, the co-founder of National Sawdust, who really had this initial dream, is an amazing man named Kevin Dolan. I don't think that in my 30s I would have, um, I would have dared to think of opening a space like this. I had always imagined that one day when I was famous and like really successful, that I would you know, try to kind of capture these dreams of my life into an institution. But to have someone like Kevin and people like Jill Steinberg, who's here, you know, really believe in, in, in investing in an actual space uh, was extraordinary. And so Kevin came to me. He wanted an artist-led institution. So he wanted someone who was really thinking about all these issues and who was in the middle of it. And artists tend to really understand what's happening because we're, you know, constantly, um, Borges says you have to create as if the sand were stone. And that is exactly how artists have to create. Everything is always falling underneath us and we're always trying to create a new status quo. And so in that sense, and I was trying to look ahead, um, when Kevin came to me, even though I had so many other dreams, I decided very consciously that this was an extraordinary opportunity and that I would in fact try to build my career side by side with this dream of having a space that would essentially serve a much larger community. Yeah, uh, so uh, in a way, National Sodast is uh, a startup. And in order to create it, you had to uh, become entrepreneur, to be an entrepreneur besides being an artist and a composer. Uh, which part was the most difficult in doing this? Um, it's definitely a startup. It's only in our third season, so we're still in our growing pains. Um, having said that, I feel more than ever that we're finding a flow, which is extraordinary. Um, your question was, what was the most complex part? Yeah, uh, being an entrepreneur or, or being the creator uh, from the artist's point of view? I mean, I think, you know, I always was an entrepreneur. I think even from the early days, you know, at Juilliard, I knew that I was going to have a very difficult time having a career, and so I was already beginning to think about what was the context within which my life would be able to flower in the best way? And so I started a production company. So in, in a sense, I've never separated the artistic from how to then make that artistic uh, voice actually um, manifest. And so I would say that probably, if I could be honest, the hardest part was the funding, <laughs> you know? Because we weren't saying, even though you see Renee Fleming on the video, it's not like Renee Fleming is performing every night at National Sawdust. The point of National Sawdust is to discover the new, to hear it new, to use these extraordinary um, talents who have been mentors to me to help discover a new generation. And so to find um, you know, philanthropists and visionary philanthropists who are willing to invest in what's new and what's not tested, and to understand that failure comes hand in hand with great, great risk is a huge testament to what you can find in New York City, I think. So you had to have your own pitch, like a startup uh, with a yes. venture capitalist. Yes, definitely. 
definitely, you know, so we should say uh, something funny, which is that it wasn't always called National Sawdust. It had a name which was terrible. It was called Original Music Workshop. Say that three times fast. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> but more importantly, it autocorrects to on my way. So every time you would text someone, you'd be like, oh, I'm going to orbit on my way. And it was like terrible. And a friend of mine was like, why don't you just call it what's on the building? It's such a cool name. And on the building was this, you know, old logo that was fading away that was called National Sawdust. And um, we had been doing, you know, to, in order to start, we had been doing these performances in the raw venue to kind of, in a time-lapse way, capture the progress of the architecture through live performance to show the city eventually that when we opened, this was really vibrating with music, you know, ever since the inception. Um, and finally, you know, finally when we, we did open, we actually renamed it to National Sawdust, and I think it was probably a good choice. <laughs> Uh, it has some specific uh, uh, technical uh, uh, features uh, to enhance uh, the experience of music, right? Yes, yeah, so the original intent was to create a modern-day Esterhazy. The idea is that composers and musicians of all styles would be inspired to actually write for a space. And that doesn't really exist because often composers and musicians don't actually have time in a space. And so our residents, which range between 12 and 20 per year, actually get about 20 hours of recording time, four performances, seed funding, all the things that I would have died to have in my 20s to kind of create the path of my life is now infused into this next generation of artists who come um, and hopefully you know, have a platform. The space itself is a cage and cage construction, which means that um, there's about two feet of space between um, the bottom uh, structure and the actual physical space, which allows for shock absorption, which means that like if a semi-truck were to hit outside, knock on wood, it doesn't, you wouldn't actually be able to hear it in the space. But more importantly, you can't hear the subway, and it fits the value of the world's finest um, recording studio. So it doubles both as a recording studio and as a live performance space. Uh, you mentioned that you have uh, uh, around 12 artists uh, in residence every year. How do you choose them? So, you know, we're still in year three, so I want to say that we do have submissions and they're for our summer labs. And summer labs is where we open the space for five days to about 12 different groups. And then we test them and we learn about them and then they would come into the actual residency program. For now, we're still actually choosing the 12 groups because we we're, in a way, defining ourselves through the artists that come through our space. And we're still three years old, and so that kind of branding is hugely important. So we're constantly on the lookout. Our curators send us names. Our advisory boards send us names, and then we come together um, as a team, and we choose who we think are between the 12 and 15 artists that would benefit the most. Because the thing is, is that not everyone benefits from what Sawdust has to offer, and we obviously want to learn how to be better, but also in these early years where we have such a, you know, we're refining our infrastructure that, that we'd be successful for them. And uh, they, uh, I mean, uh, uh, they have all uh, different genres, right? All from, different genres. From uh, classical yeah. to jazz, uh, from rap to whatever. <laughs> so there's a focus on composition. I'm not going to lie. As a composer, that's definitely closest to my heart. There's a focus on opera because I'm an opera composer and I love opera. Um, but then we do really look to see who are the artists that are creating at the top of their, um, you know, specific genre, who are actually pushing the envelope forward. And if that happened, I mean, one year we did have a rapper in residence, and she was extraordinary. But we've also had um, phenomenal young groups. We had a, a beautiful Lithuanian violinist who no one had ever heard of, and then WQXR named him Artist of the Year, right along with Rene Fleming, which was a huge testament because he didn't have a reputation till then. So it's very different, and it's you know really about trying to find the right mix. Um, because they do actually all develop projects, whether they're CDs or productions, that are going to go on beyond our wall and, again, really help us define our mission and our brand. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that your very first startup, uh, uh, you Vision into the, Art. Yeah, and it's still running. What was so it? it's still running, but it's, it, I merged that company into National Sada. So I had my own company, production company, called Vision into Art, which is tattooed on my neck. So, you know, it's a, too bad that we had to change that name. <laughs> but um, once we started National Sada, which was so clearly like a strong, beautiful thing, it made a lot of sense to bring that company, which produced my large scale work as a touring arm of National Sawdust. And so now it's not just my work, but other people's works. And we actually have outposts at the Kennedy Center every year. So we have three shows a year that go to the Kennedy Center. 
Um, we have shows that go to the Wallace Annenberg in LA, and um, those are the touring arm, which used to be Vision into Art, and then we have a record label, which used to be Via Records and is now NS Tracks. So it's, I, I think of it as a real incubator. You know, if you can think about what it takes to really um, ideate something and commission it and start from the ground up and then take it all the way to dissemination and what that means today, whether you know, you're disseminating as a production or as a record, it's meant to be this kind of 360 degree um, look at what it takes to be an artist. Yeah, incubator, you are using another term that uh, uh, I mean, reminds uh, the bad news shared uh, in the New York tech uh, uh, community, startups community. Uh, do you have interactions with? Uh, we do, we actually have a um, great partnership with New Inc, which is the incubator of the New Museum. And we choose two artists per year that actually go through the National Sawdust Residency, but at the same time track through the New Inc Residency. And the reason for that is that we have some, um, some people who, who do both film and music. And because we don't have the skills of actually helping Umbrella, a filmmaker, you know, we really decided to, you know, these projects are multimedia. So when they fit into that kind of um, program that the New Inc can help with, we share residents. Yeah, and, and also uh, the idea, the importance of collaboration uh, among different cultures, uh, different backgrounds. Uh, it's, it's crucial. I mean, the, you know, cross-cultural collaboration, obviously, as, a, as an Italian and as an immigrant, uh, is very close to my heart. Um, and I think that's also what makes New York City so special, you know, to have a city that brings together all these different cultures that are constantly examining each other and pushing each other and trying to find a way to coexist, obviously, is, is reflected in the, in the work that artists make. And so we try to really, um, I guess the word would be inclusion, you know, in the way that we program. I often say that our stages need to look like the lives we want to lead. And my life, you know, is a life that is, you know, is multiracial, both so, so I want to make sure that the artists that we help represent, um, you know, a, a, a deep cross section of cultures and of races and so on and so forth. Yeah. So talking about your life, uh, you said you're an immigrant. You were born in Italy in Trento, and uh, uh, so what about the, the, the your family? Is the music in the DNA of your family? It is. Um, so my father makes reeds and musical instruments, and. Um, we came to the States when I was very young. We moved to Nogales, which is um, a small border town between Arizona and Mexico. And the reeds that he used to grow the cane was grown uh, both in uh, southern France and in northern Mexico. And he wanted a life change, so we moved there. Uh, long story short, it's really my mom who is the reason I'm writing music, because she was so passionate about it and you know, raised me with these values of like having to, to, to practice and having to study. And um, so, you know. Here I am. <laughs> so, uh, which instrument uh, you started playing and uh, how old were you? I started playing the piano at four. Um, my mom was a pretty strict mom, so she would make me practice like, you know, three to four hours a day. As I grew older, um, it's a funny story because, she, you know, she worked full time, she was a single mom and I had a nanny who was Mexican and wasn't musically trained. And so my mom would say to her, just make sure she practiced three hours and make sure it's the Beethoven, it's the Chopin, you know, whatever I was had coming up. And I never practiced, you know, Beethoven or Chopin. I would actually practice my own stuff. And Maria loved it. She was like, oh, this is so beautiful. And so, you know, she constantly would tell my mom, you know, she's doing a great job. <laughs> and then I had my first recital and it was a disaster. You know, I like couldn't remember anything. And my mom was like, what's going on? And I said, I want to write music. I don't want to do this. And so she found me a teacher and then I started writing music and the rest is history. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so from Trento to Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, the change is uh, quite big. Uh, what do you remember of the impact of the new environment on your I mean, quite honestly, I don't remember a lot. In the sense that I, I was three. So oh, by the time I moved, I was, you know, basically um, growing up, you know, steeped in a different type of uh, a culture, both Mexican and American. Having said that, my mom was completely, um, I mean, she's more Italian than most Italians in the sense that, you know, when you leave your country, you're, you, many times you can feel like you don't belong. And for her, I think, even though at the end of the day she ended up loving the desert and the expanse, she still very much felt like she didn't belong. And so a huge part of that was constantly going back to Italy every summer and speaking Italian in the house. And, you know, so there was a really interesting thing that I, I now can look back and understand, which is that there was a huge value um, in song 
And so, you know, growing, growing up on the border, there was an, an immense uh, folk songs that, that really kind of, you know, basically created, created me as a musician. Um, and I, I do think that um, looking back, uh, you know, border towns are very special places and that, one, they're devoid of culture, which may, is not actually great. But at the same time, devoid of culture, big quotes around that, because in fact, you're completely steeped in a, in a different kind of way of looking at things and, a, and an understanding of, um, you know, people who, who, who can't have certain things, uh, you know, this kind of stri striving to leave a country. And, and, and so that kind of complexity, um, I think, really has informed me as an artist, this idea of wanting to synthesize things that don't necessarily belong together. I don't know if that makes sense, but that, that's you know that's kind of what I take from that time on the border. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you said that uh, you uh, uh, understood very early that you wanted to create your own music. Uh, how early? Nine. I mean, yeah, I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to Interlochen, which is a school for music, and so I started studying composition right from high school, like basically. In Arizona? No, no, it was in Michigan. It's a it's a school for music, so I pretty much. It, my high school, by the time I was in high school, I, if I, you know, let's, let's put it this way, if I didn't make it as a composer, I probably wouldn't be able to do much else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, but you were trained uh, uh, as a classic uh, uh, musician, so yeah. when did you um, uh, decide that you were interested in uh, uh, experimental music? I mean, the thing is, is that when you write music, by nature, it's going to be experimental because you're not going to write music that sounds like Mozart. You know, so I don't think you think of it necessarily as experimental in the sense that it's it's the language that congeals within you that's very personal, um, and you know that's experimental. I mean, that the kind of curiosity that it takes to make music um, makes it new, if you will. Does that make sense? So, so I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. You start off by mimicry, right? That's as a composer. You start off by saying, "I'm going to write music that sounds like this because that's what you know." But slowly, you begin to refine that voice to be something that's very personal, and that is, you know, what each composer brings to the field—something very unique, a very unique voice. So uh, let's watch and uh, listen to uh, some of uh, a, a, a video of uh, a work by Paola. Do you want me to prepare it, or should we watch it first? Watch it first and then. Sister of mercy wore around her waist. I 
find the chain that binds a wedding couple in an old Sardinia. to a residency with Philip Glass in Lecce. And I had always been going to the northern part of Italy, and to be frank, I didn't see myself there. When I went there, I, I, I loved going to Italy, but I, I couldn't imagine my life, you know, I, uh, in the sense that I, I, didn't, I didn't see the confluence of cultures or this, this, um, this way in which even my family could fit in. My, my husband's, you know, half black and half Japanese. I have a biracial child. I liked it, but I couldn't feel it. And then I went to the South, and everything changed. <laughs> All of a sudden, I, I understood it as this nexus of, you know, civilizations and cultures and crossing and, you know, languages that were going extinct, and I found my way in. Now, that sounds, you know, I, I actually love Italy, and I find myself there now very much, but it was my way into the culture. And so what I did is I began to explore um, ancient folk songs, from all over the South, and began to call together uh, poetry from Dante to Aleardo Aleardi, Ungaretti, and created essentially a panoply of what it would be like if you had an archaeologist, and that's played by Helga Davis, who's this amazing vocalist who has a four octave range but isn't classically trained. Um, and I was experimenting, so I wanted to understand what would it be like if you had a folk singer and an improviser and two classically trained singers. And um, the piece was done uh, in short at New York City Opera. And it was an amazing experience. There was, you know, it, it was like people just jumped up to their feet and were clapping, and it was like such a good feeling. And it was the very first time I got a New York Times review. And so I remember waiting, and I was thinking, this is going to be it. My life is going to change. I'm going to be told that I'm amazing. And it's going to be an amazing review, because I felt it, you know, like in my heart. I felt so proud. <laughs> and um, my son was, you know, nine months old. I remember being in the airport, and I got a, you know, I got a ping. And um, it was, in short, the worst review you could ever imagine in your life. And what made it worse was that all of my colleagues got these amazing reviews. And so like, I couldn't even hide, you know? I couldn't be like, oh, no one's gonna read it. It's like everybody read it. And um, it was very interesting because it was at that point that I began to understand how, as an artist, I would have to interface with criticism and what that would mean to me. And quite frankly, I actually stopped writing for many, many months. And it wasn't until this producer named Beth Morrison said, Paolo, this piece is great, just finish it. Like, just do it for yourself, finish the work. So I ended up finishing the work, and, and this is in line of many of the things that I do until now that I'm finally getting commissioned. Up until a few years ago, I was commissioning all my work. I finished the work, um, ended up going to the Kennedy Center, went to the Barbican, um, came to New York, and it got a great New York Times review by the same person. So, <laughs> you know, it was just really interesting because, you know, that's a happy story, and I still get bad reviews, you know? It, it happens all the time. And, and now I'm able to talk, especially in my mentoring roles, to younger artists and, and you know, help them understand that it is never pleasant. Um, but the reality is you have to believe in the work you're doing and, uh, and you have to understand you know, what of criticism you can take and what you have to leave behind and form your own relationship to it. Um, and, and so then you know, this really began my love of writing for, for, for opera. And so in many ways it was my way in. And one other story I'll just say, which is that this other work I did called Aging Magician, which ended up, it's kind of a more of an opera theater piece, went to Broadway, but I developed it at the Walker in Minnesota, and the main person there heard it, and he said, you know how to write for opera. And that was how I got my first large-scale opera commission, was actually through the work that I had been doing my, myself. And, and so all of a sudden, my path made a lot more, more sense in some ways. I'm curious, have you uh, talked with that uh, critic uh, by the New York Times? No, I avoid them. <laughs> <laughs> I see them in a room and I try to go to the other side. You know, there's still, I think it's hard for them too. Everybody knows they're there, you know, they don't want to be looked at. You know, you just leave. I, I leave that to my PR person. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about another opera of yours, uh, um, talking about collaboration, uh, even uh, between art and technology. You, you have an opera uh, titled uh, the Hubble Cantata that you created uh, with an astrophysicist, is that so? Yes, so this was a work um, that was commissioned for the 25th anniversary of the Hubble Telescope. And um, 
it was an exploration with a, a wonderful astrophysicist named Mario Livio, who was the um, yes, yeah. <laughs> a beautiful astrophysicist who actually was the head of the Hubble Space Telescope Institute for 20, many, many years, more than 25. And um, I had read his blog, and his blog was this beautiful blog that allowed you to really understand these deeply profound, complex scientific things like dark matter in ways that someone like myself could understand. And so, this is funny, I contacted him online and I found his email and I was like, oh, my name is Paula and these are you know, all the things I've done and I would die to do something with you. you, know, would, you would you be willing to talk to me? <laughs> and so he gave me a, an appointment and we talked and he said, I see here that in 2007 you got a bad review by the Washington Post. <laughs> I was like, is this really happening? I was like, well, I said, yes, that probably was a bad review. I said, you know, have all your books gotten great reviews? And he said, no. No, they haven't. And so that became it began a really lovely friendship where we, you know, to this day are deep friends. Um, and he basically helped me create a libretto that was told through the, uh, the eyes of an astrophysicist who loses his wife and essentially tries to kind of reconcile, if you will, um, the cosmos. And so it culminates in a VR experience, virtual reality. So what, it was actually the first piece to include VR for free, and we did it in Prospect Park to, for 6,000 people who had VR for free, which was amazing, and we created this work with this amazing young filmmaker named Eliza McNitt, who now is completely launched. Her career is incredible. She got the first seven-figure deal for VR at Sundance, and we created um, what it would be like to go through the Orion Nebula, and so at the very culmination of the piece, once he's reconciled and talking about extrasolar life and, you know, kind of reconciled his wife's death, you actually put the VR glasses on and you experience this deep, um, you know, travel through the cosmos. <laughs> and that was done at LA Opera uh, subsequently. Is it going to be done again? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so because I think that unfortunately technology dates itself very quickly. And so whereas when we did this three years ago, it was actually very cool to have like a five minute VR experience. Now it's, you know, the technology is so rapidly changing that um, I'm happy I did it and I, the music exists and I would do, you know, I have three other places that are interested in doing the music, but I'm leery about doing the technology because I see um, people, people experience VR much more frequently now. Um, yeah, you are one of the very few women in charge of uh, an important uh, art institution. Uh, which kind of stereotypes did you have to fight, to fight uh, in order to succeed? You know, I found that the stereotypes I had to fight to succeed were more at Juilliard and in my early days than they are now. Um, I feel very fortunate in that um, I'm surrounded by, you know, a great board, and I think they see me, and I don't worry so much about that. I think the composition field still has a long way to go, and I have definitely suffered as a composer and a female composer. And I definitely, I, mean, I wouldn't have started everything I started if it had been easy for me. I knew very quickly that I was going to have a hard time, and so actually, the only award I've won to date is something called the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans. And it was amazing because at that point, I was already in my master's. I had, you know, I was realizing that everything I, you know, everything was kind of a little harder. And I got into a room with Paul Soros, and he said, um, we were a bunch of fellows, it was our first year, and he said, okay, he says, you have one pie left, what do you do? And we all raised our hand, we were like, you share it, you know, you divide it. And he said, no, no, you make more. And that was amazing, because it was like, you know, they were all thinking about, you know, ways to change their environment, and that began my understanding that if I actually wanted to survive as a composer in this field, I would have to actually be worried not just about my own work, but about the context within which I was living. And uh, uh, how do you divide your time between composing and managing a national sodast? So, you know, at the beginning, I think uh, while we were trying, because we took about, you know, seven years to, to, till opening. And so then it was much more fluid because I would take meetings and I could write every day, um, which is, you know, pretty necessary when you're writing music. Um, and I actually was very lucky because I had about three or four big pieces kind of all come to fruition when the National Sodas opened in that year. So it kind of looked like I could do everything. And that's just not true. I mean, the reality was <laughs> after, you know, I wasn't writing because I didn't allow myself to think of it as a huge project that needed to gestate and needed its time. I wanted to do it all. 
And I think that um, now, finally, uh, I seated and I'm no longer the executive director, and I feel very proud of having brought the space to this point, but now I'm the artistic director uh, and, and co-founder, and I'm allowed, you know, I'm allowing myself now the time that I actually need, which is I write several days a week, and then I take a ton of meetings, and I boil that all into, like, you know, as few days as I can, and then, you know, balance it that way. And what about the balance between uh, uh, being an artist, uh, the manager, and the artistic director, and being a mother? You said you have a son who is now nine years old, right? Yes. Uh, so does he, does he play an instrument or He right? does. He plays the cello, and he plays the drums. Um, he doesn't think I do anything because I write on the computer. So he's like, I don't want to do what you do. <laughs> he wants to be like his daddy. Um, my husband's a cellist. Um, you know, I don't know how to say it, but when you have children, you, you know, they, you, your heart expands and your time is, you know, absolutely split in the sense that you have to, you know, you're, my, ba my biggest, if, if I fail at being a mother, I'm never going to forgive myself. So I make time for him and it's complicated, you know, luckily my husband's a musician, so we understand each other's lives, which are, you know, constantly, you have to be on almost all the time and, you know, you have to be away for shows. Um, and Tommaso goes with us everywhere, and he's a very special child, and I feel very lucky, very blessed, because he seems to be normal <laughs> <laughs> thus far. <laughs> but he started playing uh, because he wanted it, or you? Uh, oh, no, he started playing because he wanted to. I actually wanted to put him in all these other things, and he wanted to do music. Um, he's also in the Brooklyn Youth Chorus, which is adorable. Mm -hmm. That's, it just, he loves it. But you don't do like your mom. You don't force him. No, but you know, the thing is, I'm super grateful that my mom was so hard on me, you know? And I don't know, I mean, that's something I, I, I'd have to really investigate that because we definitely, like, we're, we're, we're not, you know, easy going like, you know, bohemian parents, but at the same time, we're, we're not as hard as, as our parents were on us. So who knows? I mean, we're trying to strike a balance. Uh, and you said also your husband uh, is an artist, he, he plays uh, the cello. Right, plays the cello, yeah. yeah and, and not only that, but he has worked with you on different uh, um, uh, pieces of arts, mm -hmm. including uh, this new opera that you are uh, composing uh, uh, based on uh, Old Man in the Sea. Anyways, yeah. uh, exactly. So, how is it collaborating as a couple? It's complicated. I mean, you know, and the, the, I always pass everything I write by him, um, and I always get very mad at him, and he still <laughs> still allows me to ask him, which is great. Um, and it's 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 also wonderful in the sense that you know I trust him with my music in a way that I don't trust many other people, and I value his opinion in everything I do. So it's it's the the good outweighs the bad. Never a conflict. Of course, there's conflicts. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I mean, you know, the good thing is working with Robert Wilson. He's such a big figure that you know nothing that we do could overshadow him. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a good balance. He's definitely the you know the the big ego in the room. <laughs> and I should say, neither I don't think my husband and I have huge egos. So we tend to it, not I don't know. We work well. Cool. I read that uh, um, to 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 stay in shape, you do boxing. That's I so do. I actually started boxing four months ago because I was very stressed and angry, and it. Just <laughs> things, and I had never really been angry before. You know, like I've always kind of worked things out in a really proactive way. Like I, I have a lot of people that I confide in, and I talk through things, and I just couldn't work this out. And I've been walking by this. Keep in mind, I've never worked out in my life, so I don't want to pretend like I'm some fit person. I'm not. <laughs> this is a new thing, and I'm really enjoying it. You, you read the Wall Street Journal piece that yes. said, yeah. <laughs> I actually put that in there before I started boxing so that I would have to do it. <laughs> it was a speeda. Um, no, I like it because it keeps me in shape and the person tells me what to do, otherwise I'm, I would never work out. And it allowed me to work through some issues that I was having that really needed contact, apparently. <laughs> Something that wasn't a human. <laughs> So, talking about your future projects, uh, that piece I think uh, um, said that you are thinking of uh, opening satellites, maybe in London, in Tokyo. So Kevin and I, when we started this, we definitely thought a lot about franchising. I think that was a little bit before we realized how hard it would be to actually start a space. 
I think now, when I think about you know the kind of five-year plan for National Sawdust, um, aside from kind of just revving up into the business plan and, and really allowing that to settle, because right now we're still you know figuring out how that works. Um, so aside from that kind of solidifying and being stronger, my dreams for the space are actually that the work that we do begin to franchise. So it's, I'm not so sure now about capital investments and whether it would make sense to actually have another space in London or Tokyo um, because I've seen how hard it is to make it. But I am confident that the work that we're investing in and having these partnerships with the Kennedy Center, hopefully with the Barbican, with the Wallace Ann and Bergen LA, we have pieces going to LA Opera, the LA Phil, that in that way, we're not investing in stuff, but we're investing in people, and that the work be able to travel that way. I also, um, another plan is, uh, in terms of expansion, is, is a digital expansion. You know, so how do we live online? How do we really capitalize on um, you know, this kind of extreme connectivity that we have and be able to you know, stream and be able to do podcasts and be able to have the reputation actually grow through uh, visitors worldwide. And so those are the kind of two kind of concrete plans for expansion that I see um, the projects and the, the, the media center. Uh, London and Tokyo, of course, are huge cities, very important. Uh, what about Italy? Do we have any projects <laughs> about Italy? I have personal work. I'm going to Milano for a show with, uh, in, in, the, in the summer. Um, you know, I wish I did know, you know, I, w I would love to do more in Italy. I, I think that it would be incredible. I, I guess I think of those cities because they have such huge, cult they're such huge cultural centers um, that really value, uh, you know, new technology and all that's new. And in order, I mean, I think the reason why National Sada's really hit a nerve in this city is that there needed to be something that was really focused on discovery and focused on the next generation. And so I just don't have that connection to Italy, but if it existed, I would, I would take it running. I would yeah. take the opportunity running. <laughs> um, well, what is your message to young music musicians? Um, you said that you have always felt that you were also an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur. So what is the message about uh, looking for opportunities or creating your own? I mean, I think that the, the field is changing so quickly, and the kind of master composers, if you will, themselves don't know how to sustain a career. And so when I do talk, like just yesterday I gave a lecture at Juilliard, I, I do talk a lot about um, you know, imagining the life they want to have, but also recognizing that it's you, most typically, or most usually, you cannot just be a composer. And so often I talk about the 21st century artists and I talk about the different skills it takes to survive. You need to be an entrepreneur or an activist or an educator. But at the same time, you can't be all those things because you also have to write music and that's not necessarily in everyone's DNA. But acknowledging that it takes more than one thing to survive and finding the things that you're naturally good at and beginning to invest in those things and also investing in your direct community. I think that for a lot of young artists, they think that the New York Phil Commission or the LA Phil Commission is what they should shoot for and that's gonna sustain them. When in reality, what sustains you 95% of the time aren't those commissions. They're the commissions that are given to you by your friends because those friends in school end up being the, the new heads of tomorrows. The secretaries end up being the thought leaders. And so how do you nurture a very authentic community from the ground up, understanding that that's gonna be your bread and butter for the rest of your life? And so I wish that schools would demyth, uh, I don't know if it's a word, but demythicize, if that's a word, um, the stereotype of the artist because it actually only does damage. Um, there are very few people who have the career that they think they're gonna have. And um, times are changing. So you know, it's, it's important to, to keep up. And I think for National Sawdust, that's the reflection of our time. How does, as a space, that really serves as a bridge between emerging and professional life. What can we do to help these artists find their footing so that it, it perhaps is a little less hard than it was for me? <laughs> okay, I will stop here. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Paola, and uh, open uh, the floor to your questions. Okay, first one. Well, the first question is, uh, what do you study in Juilliard? I studied composition. Both my bachelor's and master's. Now for your operas, will you write your own libretto or pickup? Very many different things. For Oceanic Verses, most of the libretto was uh, called by me, but no, I don't I don't write the words myself. I, I tend to work with librettists. So music. Now, will you compose for it?
Italian, an Italian of an English, you know, European They're multilingual. So the, the, the work right now for Old Man in the Sea is actually in Spanish and in English, um, and in uh, a, a dialect. And Oceanic Verses was in actually several uh, dialects, Italian dialects, Italian and English as well. Yes. Do you have any influence of Mexican music? That, that yes, definitely. You you I, I think so. I mean, I think song. You know, the, the, the kind of value of song and of lyricism and how that you know how that ties into the music. Absolutely. I and mean, that's the those are the that's the music I grew up with. So I think it's definitely there. I've also composed a lot in Spanish, so I think, you know, I, one of my big pieces was based on Octavio Paz. I'm a huge lover of um, Mexican culture. So is it Spanish? Okay. okay. It is Spanish, Italian, Italian, English, done. <laughs> that would be, that would be the next question. <laughs> the operas that, that you compose, are they uh, to be performed in a traditional type opera house or in a very different type of space? No, they can be done anyway. So Hubble was done outside. Um, and it's more of a cantata. But the Oceanic Verses has also been done in many different ways. Um, some of them have traditional sets, so the one in Minnesota will be a grand opera and will probably be done in more traditional ways. The work that I commission for myself is always genre bending and always in some ways site specific so that they can exist in different interpolations. And, and, and that last question. And that's <laughs> yeah. what so it does. Uh, what's the performance space like? Is it like a traditional theater? Or no, it it's actually uh, also very modular. Uh, so it can be set up in any way, and it seats about 175, so it's quite intimate. But also we have standing room shows where there's about 300 people. It's a good question. Um, so I often work with interdisciplinary, uh, you know, in inter interdisciplinary models. So often, if I'm working, for example, with a filmmaker or a visual artist or even Bob Wilson, we work um, in timelines and actual, like, you know, visual um, modules. So uh, large timelines that have time and that kind of express horizontal and vertical thoughts, both in music and in visuals. Um, I, a lot of my work takes a long time to build, and half of it is practical, so it's the fundraising, and the other half is also that I tend to have several projects going on at the same time. I, and so in that sense, they're not things that go quickly, so by the time I actually put them out, I'm kind of done with the statement. I'm not one of these people who go, looks back. So once I'm done, I'm pretty much moving forward. Having said that, I think that there's also, because it's, I'm not Philip Glass, like I'm not someone who everyone's like, oh, that's Paolo Bristini, her music is this. No one really expects anything, so what I try with each piece is to really further the language in a different way. Um, and to me, that's what's really exciting. It may not sound different to someone else, but in one work I might be exploring technology, whereas in another I'm exploring you know, a, different, a different, more motivic language versus a melodic language. And so those are ways that I keep myself, hopefully, looking forward because um, there is a value, especially in the critical world, of what's new and that everything always has to be different and new. And, and while that's very healthy, it can also be very stressful because then every time you're looking at your work, you're thinking, okay, the next time it's gotta be something completely different. And so, you know, trying to kind of manage that expectation with reality is, you know, is, is a challenge. Um, I love the work. It has a very mystical quality. I noticed that you have the archaeologists. Do you draw inspiration from, let's say, sacred spaces? Hmm. Do you visit? No, I don't, but I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to do some more traveling right now. It's all in my mind. Um, but when you, like, when you did that film, that was, no, I was that, actually. That was, Sardinia. That, was, uh, that was actually Lichen. Oh, in Lichen. Yeah, and I was absolutely inspired. You know, there were Lichen all these. Amazing. Oh my God! And actually, I'll tell you a story. So, okay. um, Helga, the the amazing improviser, at the time that I worked with her, nobody knew who she was. She then went on to be the lead performer on Einstein on the Beach. So she became like this like super iconic performer. 
But we went and discovered all these kind of empty spaces. In Lecce, there's been like, you know, all these gorgeous mansions that have been deserted. And so we went and we would try to film in them and we didn't get passes, which is not the best thing to do. Um, there's another funny story about that. But the story I want to tell you is that there was these wires. I don't know if you saw them in the film. And she did this unbelievable improvisation with them, which for her really dealt more with racism. And we filmed it, and we, it ended up being this backdrop to a piece called Femine, which is this song that these kids had sung for me that said, women of the field, you go out in two and you come back in four. That was about rape. So later, um, the groundskeeper of the, the house came up, and he told us that they were actually just used to hold bread. And it was just so interesting, because this thing that had meant so much to her in this improvisation you know, had this duality that was, in, in fact, very light. So it's, uh, it's an interesting story. When did you start thinking that you would do opera? When did you start thinking, composing, thinking of opera? I mean, pretty much when I started Oceanic Verses, which was the first few years after Juilliard, I always loved the voice, and I knew that I wanted to work large scale. And so pretty much since then, I've been focusing my career that way, because it's once you start getting opportunities in that field, it be, people start to know you that way. And it doesn't mean I don't want to do other things, but I'm now focusing there because I, I do have such a passion for the voice. As I understand, uh, your artistic career is quite uh, not unique, but peculiar. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you mix uh, different uh, way of expression uh, and also your set of music. So the question is, uh, did you met uh, uh, other, or you have your knowledge, uh, did you met other personal other artists uh, which are going the same way that yes. you are doing? Yes. Yeah, so at Juilliard it, it was hard because I didn't. It, it was very traditional. But as soon as I graduated, I met John Zorn. And he became a really good friend of mine. And he gave me my first record deal and really taught me you know, I became a curator at his space and performed at his space all the time. And so I began to see these other ways. And then I met uh, Philip Glass. And of course, he's had a very peculiar career. He became a mentor, and we became very close. Um, and slowly, you know, Lori Anderson, Terry Riley, like all the people who are now on my advisory board are not people I met in school. They're people that I've met in the field working. And so I began to model my career based on these profoundly like amazing examples um, that showed me that you know I could do things in an alternative way. People have done it, just you know, a little less typical. But. Mm -hmm. I know there's a composer here in the room. <laughs> Any question, Roberto? Yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. Ciao, Paola. Ciao. <laughs> I want to know if you have any favorite piece. You know, when we create, it's a uh, piece became like our child. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you have any one that you're attached for uh, some reason of your compositions? Ah, oh, it's a nice question. Thank you. Um, I'm attached to a few different things for different reasons. I think uh, it's not always the last piece I've written, though. Like I, I, I began to learn so much about orchestration with my first grand opera that was Gilgamesh. And that was a really great experience, so I'm kind of attached to that for some reasons. But then um, there's also kind of relationships that you build through projects. So for example, Aging Magician, I got to work with this man named Randy Eckert, who's this brilliant downtown performance artist. And the experience of building that we built it at the Armory was so profound and beautiful, and it became a life friendship. And so I'm, I'm, and, and I wrote it for um, the man who, who did end up raising me, and he's at 86. So it was a very profound experience of uh, dedicating something to somebody and, and you know, it's, uh, that piece is probably my favorite for more emotional reasons, yeah. <laughs> uh, being in New York, uh, what is the musical scene in New York? What's going on uh, apart from uh, National Sodast? What, what's new? So, I mean, I think what's exciting about the musical scene is for the past 20 years, there's been a really deep, deep um, emphasis on minimalism, which is obviously awesome, but also kind of tiring when there's only one thing that's pervading. And so I think right now what's really interesting is that there's a swing back to a more intellectual time. Um, and the, you know, maybe not my favorite music, but I, I appreciate so much the craft that I think it's very interesting that these kind of, um, you know, this kind of composition is, is taking center again. Um, I think that downtown 
and Uptown don't exist anymore, which is also really liberating because people are creating in all different styles that are accepted. Um, and I think that you know the way that electronics has played a role in composition is really interesting, and the way that it's really bled with pop culture is interesting. So all this to say that I think it's a much more open time, um, but at the same time in the kind of super highbrow field, I think it's moving away from minimalism, if anyone's interested in going more <laughs> to, to more intellectual moments, which is it's interesting. It's a pendulum. You know, the, the beautiful thing about all this is it's a pendulum. And where do you go to uh, find the new uh, music? Which venues uh, do you? I, I don't. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I, I have a venue. So I, I'm, you know, we have people that work for me who go out and discover. And then I have curators. And they're actually the people who bring me the people that they have vetted. And that's their job. My job is to make sure that the venue is funded and that the artistic direction is clear. But I'm not out there scouting. And that's often something that's, you know, I have an assistant purely because I get so many emails because people think that I'm the one who's booking the space. So I get like, you know, 400 emails and I have to sift through it to see like the 10 that I want to answer. And, um, you know, that's, that's just because of the perception that, that it's a, you know, I'm the cook, the wife, the thief, and the lover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> us an idea of uh, uh, the program uh, that National Sudas offer the next few weeks? Months. Sure. So like on the macro level, just to help understand that there's residencies and that's what where we really commission artists and help them, uh, you know, bridge from professional, emerging to professional life. Um, we have festivals and those festivals are curated where they're given more space, more time, more money. Um, we have the Hildegard competition for young uh, women or non-binary composers. Um, and that's uh, where three composers a year receive $7,000 of recording, and um, it's geared specifically toward, towards women or, uh, or um, composers who identify as non-binary. And uh, then we have uh, the Summer Labs, which is our big discovery, where we really bring people on that we get like about 500 to 1,000 applications, and then they get time in the space for free, and we discover new things. Um, this month, it's exciting because it's a very, very vast month. It started with Persian um, women uh, composers, which was really interesting, and it goes all the way um, to the New York Philharmonic was just the other night. Um, the Brooklyn Youth Chorus is coming up. Um, amazing Jazzers, the Creative Independent, which is my favorite journal of Kickstarter, curates a whole series of experimentation. So it's pretty, it's pretty varied. I mean, it's, you know, I think that the way we curate is the way that one listens to music now. You know, you pick up your device, whatever you listen on, and you're going to go from opera to indie to, you know, whatever it is. You might listen to Bach because you're in the mood. And that's the way the space is. It's just about quality. I think at the beginning that was hard because people didn't understand what we were. But, you know, I've gotten comfortable with non-identification. And did you have, or, or do you have now, Italian musicians at uh, Sylvester? Absolutely, yeah. yes. We've had Claudio Prima, who's a beautiful folk singer. We have quartets. We have a lot, there's a great jazz scene in Italy, so we have a lot of jazz. Um, but I'm always open to more. You know, it's interesting because a lot of the, the work that we do bring is because of partnerships with embassies and partnerships with cultural um, institutions, and that, that helps us because, of course, the prices of the visas and everything for a small organization can become prohibitive. But we're constantly looking for that kind of bridge. Thank you. <laughs> Being not that familiar, I mean, I'm happy that I, I came to listen to you, but how do, shall people get to you in the, in the National Sawdust because they know of it? In other words, how do they find you? Find me, myself? Because my name's on the website and they just figure out the email. Is that what you mean? All different age groups and all different genres. Do you mean how do audiences find, not me, but National Sawdust? <clears throat> Is that right? right. Yes, no, okay, okay, sorry. To be a part of it. So, you know, it's actually been quite a lot in the press. So we've had a, a kind of extraordinary press presence, um, which has been amazing. And I think a lot of the way people find it is by, you know, reading the you know, Times or Time Out or The New Yorker. There's literally, like, this week, New Yorker had, like, four shows in it. So a lot of it is press. Um, for a lot of it is word of mouth. I think artists are our best um, you know, asset. If they have a good time at National Sadas, then they go, they bring their audiences, they talk about it. Um, we don't have any money for publicity, so we do not do any publicity. So it's definitely not generated by us. 
it's really, um, it's, be, it's been a mixture of good press and I think good word of mouth. And when you say residency, does that mean that you're nurturing them? Yes, from? yeah, it's really a bootstrap. So they get artistic planning, they get, um, you know, mentorship, depending on what they're doing. If they're, for example, presenting an album, we have a tracks, we have a label director, so they work with that person. If they're creating a piece for tour, they work with our person who actually tours the works. Um, if they're, you know, it really depends on where they are. If they're a composer, they tend to work with me or somebody else in the company. Um, branding, all, all those things are, are the ways that they kind of come in and, and are helped. So they can be in any genre, it doesn't make a difference? Yes, with an emphasis on classical and jazz and kind of more avant-garde forms. But, right. you know, most typically we don't have pop, I'm not going to lie. It's mm -hmm. very rare that we have. But we had an amazing African singer named Jojo Abbott, and her work was a mixture of pop and African you know, music, and it was amazing. So it's, I think as long as there's a fusion or a push of a genre, it's, it's an open slate. Do you have people who specialize in, in, in scenography and costumes also? You know, it's really a music space. I mean, as much as I love multimedia, and if I could, you know, we'd have so much money that we would have that. Right now, since we're only in season three, the focus is really just on the music. Having said that, when we commission pieces for the kind of larger, the larger touring arms, then there is a thought about scenography. We've done some operas. I don't know if in the first video you could see, we pretty much transformed the space, but it's always simple and not a lot of money. The, the money really goes to the talent. Uh, you mentioned that when you start to compose, you start to imitate someone. Yeah. Who was your idol? That's a good question. I mean, I think I was a real romantic, so my mimicry was like, you know, probably the stuff I should have been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> Chopin. <laughs> now, like, I don't, now I don't like Chopin, but at the time, you know, like very florid, very flowery stuff, and then slowly I got away from it and tried to figure myself out. <laughs> So this is our second year at the Kennedy Center coming up. Uh, I mean, the projects go everywhere. So they've been touring to all these different venues. But having a specific national status residency at these venues is just happening now. So we'll be in our second year this year at the Kennedy Center and our first year in LA. And then we'll be um, in the Netherlands um, as well. And so those are the first three outposts that we're just beginning and we've just contracted for next year. Uh, you said that you are going to uh, perform also in Milan this summer? That's me, not oh. National Slot. It's the Milanesian. What are you going to do? I have a whole evening of new cello work <laughs> for my husband. So we're doing you know, cello, film, electronics, all that stuff. In which venue? I don't know yet. You know, they have it all over the city and they haven't assigned a venue yet. Interesting. Okay. Uh, there's nothing more. Very last question. <laughs> last question, maybe. You can even not answer. <laughs> no, no, sorry. This is that my professional way to approach uh, this kind of problem. Uh, how is the financial structure? It's a very good question. So it's a $4 million organization. The way that we started was actually very interesting because we couldn't find, Kevin Dolan, our co-founder, came in with $8 million. And then it, he thought that was enough. It ended up being a $16 million project. So I had a very hard time finding philanthropists who would invest in something that was so much based on risk and discovery. And so what he ended up doing was something called philanthropic investment, where he had a team of four people um, invest in the building uh, with the promise that they would donate their share of the building to the nonprofit at the appreciated value. So you know, at least seven years, and after seven years, an investment of five million could become eight million. They get that kind of deduction the nonprofit owns their space. So that allowed us to have kind of the capital and also not worrying about rent. In terms of um, the rest, it's really not so untraditional. It's like a 60-40 earned ops split. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh